Okay, so Bob, what what did your parents or how did your parents meet? It's very interesting. Let me go back a little bit and talk about Al and Etta, who are my parents. My mother came from a family that came from Germany in the early 1900s. Barney and Kate, grandma and grandpa, basically was operators who landed in lower the east side of New York. And then basically at that time, they had subway trains for people who would be working on in the the factories that were making clothing in mid Manhattan, they built five rain train uh, things out to the furthest part of Brooklyn, so that they could have all of their workers get on a train in the morning and come to mid Manhattan. That was Grandpa Barney. They. My mother had four sisters and two brothers, all living in Brooklyn at the time. My father was a single boy with five sisters. Oh, wow. my, grand my grandpa, Harry, was born in Liverpool, England. And he basically came to the United States in the early 1900s. He saw this meter being developed as cars were first getting started at that time. And the meters would go into a car and they would, every mile, they would go up whatever sense you wanted it to go up. He went over to Switzerland, purchased 64 of them, and came back and built 64 of the first taxi cabs ever made, ever produced and in New York City. This now, was, was that the yellow cab or did you did he have a, a name for his business? Well, he well, let me share it. It was from my understanding, it was a taxi cab company, and he was the first developer of it. Wow. He basically fitted out all of the drivers in West Point uniforms and taught them how to be gentlemen as they were driving their clients around. Well, three years later, they came to my grandpa, Harry, and said, Harry, thanks for showing us what we needed to do we're forming a union and we don't need you anymore. So that's where the genes came in of Harry now was living in Queens, New York, because that's where all the entrepreneurs were moving from the east side. All the workers were moving from to Brooklyn and all the owners of the factories in mid Manhattan were moving up to the Bronx. That was the expansion plans in New York City at the time. So I lived and Etta and Al lived in a one bedroom apartment in Brownsville, Brooklyn, New York, literally the home of Murder Incorporated. Oh gosh. Well, we learned the, the rules of the street were very, very important. These were communities, okay? I lived in the Jewish community, but there was an Italian community, there was a Greek community, there was an African-American community, and they lived in their own little areas. And in my area, if I went out and did something wrong, and my friend's mother saw me doing that wrong, She'd come out and paddle my butt. <laughs> then she'd bring me into my mother, and my mother would thank her. <laughs> and then my mother would take me into the bathroom and spank me again. Like the beginnings uh, of a neighborhood watch program. It actually excellent description of it. Because we all cared. 
for one another. Mm. And as it as it turned out, it was right on the corner, one block away from where I was living, was the Jewish temple where I got bar mitzvah in. Across the street from there, my grandma and grandpa Barney and Kate were living. Uh, my Aunt Faye, before she got married, was living up there. And on Newport Street, one block away from me, was my Aunt Ida and Uncle Max and their two children, Barbara and Dorothy. And across the street from me was Uncle Artie and Aunt Bell. He was the entrepreneur in my mother's family. But it was all about my mother's side really all stayed together. My Uncle Jack is the only one that moved out of the area because he became an accountant and went to work and had a pretty high paying job with the city of New York at the beginning. So they were living out towards the Flatbush Coney Island area of Brooklyn. And my father's sisters, I always thought, were ne we were never close and I always wondered why. And in my later years, it really did hit me that they were come from a wealthy family and my father is marrying into a worker bee family. Mm -hmm. And it was real interesting that it's the two of them, my mom and dad, that basically really coordinated a mixture that was that I learned even in my marriage. And I'll share that with everybody a little bit later. Oh, a mixture. Did you uh, speak German? Did he speak German? What, what was your first well, language? It was Yiddish. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was German and English combined, okay? And the thing I remember, every time I would say something or somebody else would say something, like if this had not happened, if this had not done, if somebody had done it this way, and Grandma Kate would always say in Yiddish, if the Bubba gehad eya zibis the zedi, and translated that into English, if the grandmother had testicles, she would have been the grandfather. <laughs> so I always, I always remember that. Quite a sense of humor. <laughs> well, it it was a close knit family. You're absolutely right. My grandpa, you... my grandpa Bonnie. What I remember about him. He used to take me to the cinema theater on Saratoga Avenue every Sunday for a triple header Western movies. Three Western movies we used to. I saw more John Wayne movies than you could shake a stick at. And I always remembered going with him. He'd get me popcorn and we'd sit there in, in the theater. But it was always on Sunday afternoon. He took me because I was his oldest grandson living close to there. My Aunt Ida had two girls. My dad had. But I do remember something very, very much. That was, we were living in a one-bedroom apartment. This was before World War II. And I was born... Certainly, I had a crib in my parents' bedroom. Then my brother Harvey was born. And we didn't move out. But my parents, all of a sudden, they got a sofa bed for the living room. And the bedroom was for Harvey and I. Then when my brother Harry was born in 1949, all of a sudden, we were three boys in that apartment. Wow. But... We had a hallway where my father taught us how to throw a basketball up into a net. <gasps> we really learned competition. We, oh used, we used to play with a little Spalding ball. 
that bounce. I counted 42 different games that we could play with that ball from hit the penny by putting a penny down on the sidewalk, by stoop ball, throwing it up against the stoop and catching it, the punch ball, the stick ball where we took our mother's broom sticks and cut them so that we could use them as bats. <laughs> wow. And what we did was we learned what competition was all about. Well, now, aside from your brothers, did you have a best friend there in New yeah, York? Absolutely. Melvin Shapiro lived right across the street from me. Fuzzy Wiener. <laughs> Still remember him, okay? We lived as a group because we all went to the same public school, public school 165. Did you have a favorite teacher there? Miss Hartman, my eighth grade teacher. She and why was, did you like her? She taught me what respect was. Hmm. In other words, if we did something wrong, we got punished for it. Not seriously, not hitting, you know, or anything, but hey, sit in the back of the room and don't participate in this class. But I remember the one thing I do remember is, and it, it's very important to my future generations, how important education was to our community. And I'm talking about the Jewish community at this time. Every major Jewish holiday, like the New Year or the Day of Atonement, Jubilee. And yeah. Everybody had to go to the synagogue. All of the schools in New York City were closed. Oh, wow. And the reasoning for that was not in respect to the Jewish holiday, but the fact that 80% of all the teachers were Jewish background. Oh, wow, my goodness. <laughs> well, that's what important education was, okay? Yeah. I'm wearing a shirt today from my parents' grandparents' generation built three schools in New York City, one in the Bronx, one in Manhattan, and one in Brooklyn. These were three high schools, and they had the vision in the 1920s that we were going to have to go into outer space as we overpopulate the earth. And it was during that time that I was in high school that Yuri Gagarin and the Russians beat us into space, just like we are today, where we have to rent space on a Russian thing to get us up into the International Space Station. In other words, my grandparents' generation really saw the need for three special high schools to teach us to be engineers. You had to be in the top 10% of your district classes to even be eligible to take the test to go to one of those three schools. And then they only took the top 10%. We had shops there that were unbelievable. I learned more about engineering, math, and science at Brooklyn Technical High School. And my dad literally forced me to go there. Uh, well, you obviously passed the test to get into it. So that's... Well, that we, were, we, we were in an area where I was quite lucky to be 10% of the population because we had the school that was really teaching us quite well and we had you know it, it was important for education now was there any sports at that high school or was it all just uh, engineering you're bringing up something beautiful i walked in the first time 
to the gymnasium on a tour. I saw two bowling alleys in the gymnasium. This was before they made automatic pin spotters. I happen to have been a baseball player. You know, that was a sport that we were looking at playing and I played in my freshman year on the Brooklyn Tech team. But then in my sophomore year, they developed a bowling team and they had intramural bowling right where Barkley Center is right now, where the, the next play, basketball. And I had become real interested in the sport of bowling to the point where not only was I captain of the bowling team in my senior year at Brooklyn Tech, where we happened to have won the city PSAL championship. I've gone back at times to Brooklyn Tech to see that trophy with my name on it. Oh, that's wonderful. It, it was a neat experience. And then when I got to college, I wanted to be, you know, an engineer. So I went to a Pratt Institute also in Brooklyn. Oh. And in my junior year, I actually started a bowling team in Brooklyn. Did I you have it. your own bowling ball? And how much did it weigh? Oh, it weighed 16 pounds. And was it any color or was it just black? black. It was just black. <laughs> and to get it, my mom got me a job because I wanted to buy my own bowling ball says, well, you got to go to work for this. And they got me a job at a florist delivering flowers. Never forget it. And Were you it, driving them? No, or just... no, no, no. It was just going on the public transportation. Oh, gosh. We Cars were in Brooklyn. You can get anywhere. We used to go up. It was so safe, the subways, okay, that oh. with nickel... All of us Yankee fans who were growing up in Brooklyn, we would, our parents would let us go on the train by ourselves as 11 and 12 year olds to go up to 161st Street at Yankee Stadium. And we'd go under and go where the train would go back. We could see into the stadium so we could watch the ball game. <laughs> so it was, something of a of a different generation but a yeah. little different than today and i hope that everybody in the future will understand that baseball as you can see behind me a signed picture of mickey mantle i still remember when television first came out in the early 1950s my parents never went to sleep before 1130. I always heard the television set on because they wanted to get the local news, weather, and sports. So they didn't have to get up early to read the newspaper the next day. They got all the information. And the one thing that they did at that time, it was before the Dodgers and Giants moved west. We basically had three baseball teams in New York City. And all of them were going to be, I still remember, the Yankees were on Channel 11, the Dodgers were on Channel 9, and the Giants were on Channel 11 also because they didn't play this at home the same time as the Yankees played because they were pretty close together. So... And remember my they put it on for free. You didn't have to pay for it if you had a television set. Yes, I and, remember. <laughs> and I still remember my uncles and father having arguments about who's gonna go to the game if they put it on television for free. Well, oh, mm -hmm. they created, I still remember 
the Dodger announcer, the Red Barber, get started before present uh, Yankee Stadium was Mel Allen and the Giants. I, I don't remember who. But well, you don't get the Dodger dogs and the peanuts at home, right? That that that's the 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 allure of coming to the game. Exactly right. And it the Dodger dogs got started because in Brooklyn, the most famous hot dog place is Nathan's Hot Dogs. Oh. <laughs> Memorial Day, you know, they have a hot dog eating contest. Oh, really? Oh, my. In Coney Island at Nathan's Hot Dogs. Oh, I yeah. Still, yeah, I still, they're the best of, of the hot dogs. So that was the early years of, you know, through high school. Uh, we did something in high school that was probably an interesting point to discuss at this point. Since we grew up in a neighborhood that was all Jewish friends, well, what happened when we got into Brooklyn Tech? This was a mixture of all different things, okay? And we created a Jewish fraternity at in Brooklyn Tech. And the story is, is that Max Cohen, one of our leaders, he basically started calling the B'nai B'rith girls to see if we can get a party together so that Jewish boys can meet Jewish girls. And he called this one person up, Elaine Rosenberg, and she says, we don't have a big place to have a party, but if you want to bring four of your close friends, I'll invite four of my close friends. We have a basement in our house and we can have a nice cozy party. Well, can you imagine my friend Max calling me up and saying, hey, Bob, this gal invited us to a cozy party in her basement. Basement. Well, we went there and that is where I met my wife of today, and on Sunday, June 9th, we will be celebrating our 62nd wedding anniversary. Oh but my, that, that's coming up pretty quick. That's where yeah. we met. That's where we met. That, And at that time, everybody smoked. Well, all of a sudden, there comes my future mother-in-law walking down to say hello to us when they got home from wherever they were. And two of the girls that were smoking gave me their cigarettes. So I had three cigarettes in my hand, the first meeting I had with my future <laughs> mother. She says, you smoke a lot, don't you? <laughs> so those are some interesting stories of getting, you know, where we uh, got started. Now, I wanted to ask, uh, New York is such a beautiful place, um, especially upstate New York, uh, anywhere around in New York. Did you ever go on a family vacation somewhere there? Well, um, the, the answer is my father worked for a very wealthy individual, and my father was a visionary. He started direct mail advertising. Mm -hmm during World War II. Their company would work over machinery that was bad. Their company would come in and re rehabilitate the machinery. So my father started the direct mail advertising campaign and his boss, Herman Kahn, was so appreciative of that, that every summer as I was a little kid, he would pay for a bungalow up in the Catskill Mountains. And on uh -huh. June, the end of June, the last Friday in June, was the last day of school at the public school system. Well, that Saturday, we would get in the car and we would be going up to the Catskill Mountains. Uh -huh. I might now, did, you, did you go fishing? What would you do when you were up there? Oh, I was like three, four years old. I went out, I went out in center field where my father played 
and he got me a glove and he started teaching me how to play baseball. Oh, cute. That's cute. And we learned how to swim because there was a swimming pool, you know, there or a lake. And I remember the summers. And then a week, right on Labor Day weekend, he would, oh, by the way, the interesting part of being up there is that he would have to go to work every Monday morning. So he would leave Monday morning, drive back to New York City, and go to work for the week. And then he would come up Friday. And we didn't know when he was coming up because we didn't have cell phones at the time. So we always used to, just around 7, 8 o'clock at night, start walking down the main highway to see when he's coming. And then he stayed for the weekend and left on Monday morning to go back to the city. But then on Labor Day weekend, that's when we closed up shop and we went back to Brooklyn because that Monday after Labor Day was always the day, the first day of school at the public school systems. So we did that for many, many years. But the vacation that I do remember, Grandpa Harry passed away when I was about five years old. So Grandma Rachel, she went down. I had an aunt living in Miami Beach, my Aunt Evelyn. So Grandma Rachel went down because she was the only unmarried sister my father had at the time. And she lived there. For me, I was a 10-year-old. My brother Harvey was five years old. And my brother Harry was a year and a half. My father arranged to get us on an airplane, a jet, they didn't have jet planes at the time, on an airport where we flew down to Miami Beach for the summer. I still remember going swimming every day in the ocean. And it was great being with Grandma and Aunt oh. Debra. Yeah, Miami is beautiful. Wow. It Wonderful was hot, memories. Hot and humid, though. Oh, yes. Yes. But what a time. Yeah. So did you did you ever have a pet? We started when we, lived, when we lived in Brownsville on Newport Street. The first pet I had was a yellow parakeet. Oh. And he used to fly around the room and I put him on my finger and on my shoulder and then put him back in the cage. Then we moved to East 91st Street on East Flatbush when I was in my eighth grade. By the way, I had to make a big decision at that time. If I went to the junior high school in the community, I would not be eligible to go to Brooklyn Tech because you had to graduate from the eighth grade to go to Brooklyn Tech. So I decided when we moved to East Flatbush, I would stay at 165 and graduate as an eighth grader. But that meant I had to ride a bicycle to four or five miles to school every day and back. So the, day, uh -huh. the days it rained, my father would take me in the car, you know, uh -huh. and, and go. But I had to learn responsibility. I bet. Was I, it a Schwinn? What kind of bike was it? You know, I think I did have a Schwinn bike. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I love my Schwinn, I'll tell you. Yeah. Uh, but there was a difference at that time between a boy's Schwinn and a girl's Schwinn. Yep. Right? Yeah. Yep. There was. So yeah. how about any favorite toy? Did you have a toy growing up? You know, some some kids have stuffed basic. animals, things like that before for you me, for me it was sports. Oh it was oh just if it had to do with sports, it it was in me. I had a little bat. <laughs> I had okay. baseballs. My my father's boss 
had a box seat two rows behind the Dodgers dugout. We used to, my father would take me to games. We'd be down there and he'd say, hey, you want to go into the dugout? Oh, and my. They'd give me a baseball and I'd go around and all the players would sign the baseball. Well, the next day we needed a baseball to play a game. Who had a new baseball? Me. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> So it was quite an experience, okay? And uh, But it was real interesting because the borough president of Brooklyn had a furniture store on the other side of the right field fence in Bedford Avenue. And we used to go out there with gloves to catch a home run ball that went over the big fence in Ebbets Field and prevented it from breaking his furniture store window. So if we had a baseball and we brought it into him, he would give us four tickets to the next game. So we used to stand on Bedford Avenue hoping somebody was going to hit a home run and we were going to catch it. <laughs> Did anybody do that? Do you remember who it was? The borough president's name or my friend's? No, the baseball or the the baseball uh, batter that hit oh. a home run. Do you remember who they were? Oh, I I remember Duke Snyder. Oh. Mostly le mostly left left handed players, but the one I remember most was the pitcher Don Newcomb. He would he would hit he'd hit home runs over the fence. Oh my. Wow. Yeah. Those was, are great. Quite an yeah, oh, it's quite an experience growing up in Brooklyn. I learned what teamwork was all about. Hmm. Something hmm. that is missing in today's society. Now, you, we pretty much covered your high school. What about your college years? What did you end up doing for college? First, I learned how to work. Uh, so, and, and when did you and Elaine get married then? Well, we got married after my junior year in in college. Okay, Wow. Well, That's pretty we brave. Were, we were going together. The first year, um, a good friend of mine, Al Siegel, his sister was a piano, was taking piano lessons. And his piano teacher took the equivalent of a coffee shop at a bungalow colony. In other words, in the bungalow colonies in the Catskill Mountains. Oh, oh. Okay. They had the equivalent of a coffee shop, as we call it today. And he got, Al and I got a job with the one that he was, that he owned. So he got us an apartment about a mile away that we lived in somebody, you know, a two bedroom, in a bedroom with two beds. We slept there. We then walked the mile every morning to go to work. And we, he'd somehow drive us home at night, you know, late at night when it, especially Saturday night when it was three o'clock in the morning and we had to get up at eight o'clock. But I learned what it was to be respectful to other people. And I was lucky enough that my uncle became owner of, quote unquote, a luncheonette, as they called them in Brooklyn, okay? But it was a candy store that served regular food also. So he had moved out to California, but he had taught me a little bit. So all of a sudden in my junior year, 
starting when I finished my sophomore year at Pratt, a good friend of mine and I went up to a bungalow colony right next door to where Elaine's Uncle Dave's in-laws had their facility, a, a little ranch. And it was in South Fallsburg, I'll never forget it. And we got the ability that we got the concession for the equivalent of the restaurant at the bungalow colony, Phil Feuerstein oh. and I. So here's Phil, P-H-I-L, and Bob, B-O-B. We're having a concession at Phil Barb Bungalow Colony. Phyllis and Barbara. Oh. <laughs> it was Phil Barb Bungalow Colony, and the concession is being run by Phil Feuerstein oh, and wow. Bob Ballard. <laughs> Well, we got something in there. This is when they had uh, the slide machines, you know, where you put a dime in and you can play a game. Mm -hmm. Well, oh, yes. I found somebody and they put it in and we got half the income coming from it. Wow. I'll never forget them, okay? But they come to us and they say, hey, guys, how'd you like to make some money? said, wow, just tell me how. He said, well, if I give you the results of the races at Monticello Raceway for one night and you go there, I will tell you five out of the eight winners. In other words, Monticello Raceway at the time was fixed. Oh. Well, Here's Phil Feuerstein and me. We're two engineers. And how could we go the first night? So we go the second night with his schematic of how to bet. And we lost all our money. Oh, dear. Oh, my. I go to him. He said, why did you wait? We change it every night. We don't use the same thing. So he basically helped us get the, some of the money back. But oh. that, that was real interesting. But Elaine had, uh, she had called me up and her grandfather was in the hospital. And she asked me if there was some way I can come down there. He wanted to talk to me. Fine. So I went down. I borrowed someone's car. No, we had our own car at the time. He, right. And my 51 Chevrolet. Oh, that my nice. Father, that my father financed for me through the Montauk Credit Union. Learning, So I learned at an early age how to pay for something rather than ask for something, you know, and get it. And when I went up to the hospital, he said, you two are going too long together. I think you should get married. Oh, wow. Oh. I said, I'm in my senior year. I'm going to be in my senior year. I'm going into my junior year. At, we get married next, you know, the end of the, um, the semester. I, I'm still going to have one more year left in high school. I can't afford says, you'll live downstairs with Sarah and Saul. It's oh, my, my. my in-laws. And I said, not me. I'm not living <laughs> with my in-laws. And he <laughs> said, you know what? I have a cousin who owns an apartment house right near Brooklyn College. It's right across the street from Midwood High School. I will talk to him. I will pay through the end of June when you graduate. Wow. And we got a one bedroom apartment overlooking Brooklyn College right across the street while I was going to my senior year in college. Oh my. Well, now, how did you break this news to Elaine? Well, she was there with me. 
Oh, with the grandfather? With okay. the grandfather. So that so, basically was your proposal. <laughs> that was, well, we always knew that we were going to get married, but at the end of that summer, I did have somebody who was in the jewelry business as one of the families up in the bungalow colony. So she got me a deal on a diamond ring for oh, $680. Okay. I'll never forget it. Whoa, that was a lot for then. Oh, that was my. a lot, but it was a big ring. So wow. I was able to get it and uh, give it to her. So we, uh, yeah, we basically got married. Elaine was. So did you have a, a civil ceremony or did you get married in the in the oh. synagogue or what? Did she get to have a <laughs> wedding gown? We got, absolutely. We got married at the same location where my father's boss, Herman Kahn, when I was bar mitzvah, we had a ceremony that night that 200 people showed up. Oh, my. It was that kind of bar mitzvah party. Uh-huh. And we went back to the same place and... We arranged to have a wedding there. So that was where we had our wedding. And it was okay. just, it was Temple Bethel. It's where all of the very religious Jewish people live up on Eastern Parkway in that segment right now. Mm. But at that time, it was on the other side. It was... Just a nice place. I still remember two things about that whole time frame. We had an engagement party in the basement of my parents' house in uh, Brooklyn. And I got so sick after that engagement party because it was cold outside. We were sweating down there. And I was going outside and inside. And I came down with a terrible case of bronchitis to the point where my professors were asking me to leave the class because I was bothering their teaching <laughs> by coughing so much. Oh. To the point where I said, you know what, I, I'm not going to do that. I, I'll take it for whatever it is. And what they were nice enough was instead of giving me any failing grades, they basically gave me Fs instead of, well, that had an effect because I had an under 2.0 index for that year, I was ineligible to play baseball. Oh, yes. So that's when I started the bowling team at Brad. But I did get a chance as a senior. I got my grades up and I did play baseball and bowl to the point where we bowled in the Eastern Regional Tournament in Rhode Island. Oh. And I happened to have been the number one bowler at that tournament. Wow. I came in first place. Oh. That was, crazy. with all the schools that were there in Rhode Island, the top five bowlers were going to represent District 1 and 2 at the College All-Stars, which was going to be in St. Louis, Missouri. Oh. So, and you got to go to St. Louis? Not only that, it was the first time I went on a jet plane, sat first class. First class, my oh, goodness. Oh, yeah. No, it was, and got off, and there's Dick Weber to greet us, a professional bowler in the Hall of Fame. Oh, wow. And then we got a chance to walk down holding our bowling balls and being introduced to the crowd. It was quite an excitement, except. I didn't bowl too well out there. Oh. Oh, but, what a shame. 
<laughs> but, Too much excitement. Yeah, we, we come and uh, so we were married uh, in my junior year in college. Um, I started looking for interviews for a job. I was going to become a chemical engineer and mobile oil came in to our school and I had the first interview there and they asked me if I would come up to their New York headquarters and talk to them there and I said, absolutely. Wow. Went up there and they asked me if I would consider moving to Woodbury, New Jersey, in South Jersey and working in the refinery as a technical service engineer. Wow. So wow. how could I turn that down? Yeah. Was Elaine happy with that? She was ecstatic. It, I mean, here it, it is that we're going down. You know, we had a an older car at the time. And... Uh, As we moved down there, I, I got really spoiled. We got an apartment. We had furnished it nice with a bedroom set and living room furniture and a kitchen set. And Mobile said, we'll have the movers come in and pack you up and take you down to where you're moving to. You don't have to do anything. I still remember that day, you know, we used to smoke. Well, when we opened up down in New Jersey, all of a sudden there was ashtrays full of cigarettes and ashtrays. <laughs> they just wrapped them up. <laughs> but we did not have to do anything. Wow. And it was quite an experience. And how long did you stay with Mobile? Well, overall, 10 years. Oh, so that we, was quite Yeah, we had gone down. I had worked in the refinery, and I started getting in. Computers were, were getting started while I was in college. One of the neat stories that I have, like if I could go back to my college days, in engineering, we had a professor who would he'd give us an open book test where we had to do calculations to develop an optimum temperature for something to boil at or whatever it was. But it was a full day of sitting there and calculating and doing something. We didn't have computers at the time mm -hmm. that we could just sit down with, okay? Well... I had one, but it was one of the first ones that were made. And Wait, where was it located? In our laboratory, in our oh. chemical engineering laboratory. And you had to do, you had to create the programming for it, for what to do. Well, we got a test one day and I said, holy macro. Normally you had a between three and five o'clock, you picked it up at nine o'clock in the morning, what the question was, and then you had all day to do it till five o'clock. And you had to give the answer and all the paperwork that you did. And <clears throat> it went in at nine o'clock, said, holy mackerel, that's the software program that I had developed. I'm just going upstairs and doing it. I made one mistake. Uh -oh. I came back and put the answer on the professor's table at 9.15 in the morning. Oh, dear. Oh, my. He said, Bob, you got to learn something. When you cheat, you got to be careful. You, why didn't you just bring this in at 4 o'clock or 3 o'clock? And I wouldn't have questioned that you looked over and you knew the answer. <laughs> he said, that's yeah. not what it did. I'll never forget him. He said, yeah. I'll bet you couldn't do it again if I gave you a question. 
How much you want to bet? <laughs> bet two dollars. <laughs> Never forget it. Professor Jordan. And we went, he gave me a question. I said, okay, now come with me. And we went upstairs and I ran the program. Oh my. <laughs> and here's the answer. And he says, I will never forget this. Wow. So I was always into computers and uh, somewhere after five years, something had occurred where we were working on a major expansion of the Torrance refinery and the Oslo refinery. And it came to pass where the economics were not justifiable anymore. Well, they asked me to come up to New York City and become the first computer applications manager for mm -hmm. Mobile Oil. My goodness. Unbelievable. Triple my salary. And Elaine was happy with that, huh? <laughs> well, that's a time where mothers didn't work anymore. And when we had the, we had our two daughters, um, we owned our first house. I was 27 years old in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And we're living great life. Brand new car. Wish I had it right now. Same one. And the only difference was that the house that we saw that we wanted to buy, Elaine's, my sister-in-law and brother-in-law were moving out to Huntington, Long Island. So we wound up moving out to Smithtown, Long Island. And I used to take the Long Island Railroad every day into Manhattan. Oh gosh, yeah. Well, the house wasn't gonna be ready for eight months. So we had to find the place and mobile oil. They said, just separate what you need to live in Long Beach. We moved down to the beach. And I used to take the Long Island Railroad to Penn Station every day and then just take the subway over to Mobile Oil. And everything really worked, you know, extremely nice. Then we moved out to the house and they did all the moving of furniture and everything for us. But we had again. Enough. They did it again. <laughs> again, again. <laughs> And we had a beautiful house on an old potato farm that they built 37 brand new houses in Smithtown. It was on a half an acre of property, four bedrooms. It was just beautiful. Well, you now you had the two daughters by that time? Yes. We had, so you had an extra bedroom. <laughs> yep. And we had a bedroom for my parents, when they would come out, they'd stay over because it was an hour and a half ride back to Brooklyn. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. they would stay out there when my in-laws would, you know, come out. So it, it was just, it was heavenly. I basically, in the morning, the, the Long Island Railroad, you were able to move a seat so that people could look at each other while they're talking. Uh -huh. okay. talking. You know, one to the back. Well, I learned to play bridge. Well, we started a bridge game every morning on the Long Island <laughs> Railroad going in. We would take one of that big 24 by 36 posters. We'd put it out as our table on four laps. <laughs> and the other two who ever got on last, they would play the winners of the first round. <laughs> we had the conductor. It got to the point where he had the, he used to push the seat forward 
so that and put the poster down before it came to our station. <laughs> he that knew that's nice. what we wanted to do. And at night, I used to come home in the bar car. Oh. I learned how to drink martini. <laughs> it was unreal. However, what I did was I was missing my daughters growing up. I didn't get home till seven o'clock at night. Oh, so yeah. We couldn't have dinner every night at seven o'clock. The kids had to eat a little early. Yeah. But we did it. You know what I'm saying? It, it was something that I did. I still remember in 1969 when first moon landing. Mm -hmm. Was going to happen. We were up at three o'clock in the morning to watch it. Yeah, so pretty the, exciting day. And then my parents got us our first dog. Oh, yes. Okay. We, we had a dog that lasted for a little while with us, but I had an experience that in today. 2024, more people would understand it than ever before. What was that? When I first started with Mobile Oil, they had not hired any engineers at a college for six years. And they hired three of us to work in Paulsboro, New Jersey. Unbelievable as it was, we were three Jewish boys. Three of us. Well, Lou Levy, he went up to Ferndale, Washington. Bob Allen went to New York City. And Andy Rifkin, he stayed at Paulsboro Refinery. And I get a letter coming in with a magazine, Time Magazine, from Lou Levy. He said, this is important, you read this article. And it was an article during the Suez Crisis, yeah. where basically the chandlers of every mobile oil ship were told not to take on any goods of Israeli origin. Really? And just how you did it, that's how I felt. I said, how the heck could we do this to our friends? You know, and I immediately that same afternoon went down to the third floor, went into Rolly Warner Jr., the CEO of Mobile Oil, and I wanted to speak to him about this. His receptionist said, he cannot see you, but why don't you go and talk to his assistant, Herman Schmertz. I'll never forget the name. I went in there, and for one hour, he was convincing, tried to convince me that they had to do this, or they would lose money. And I walked away from there, feeling the shareholder was more important than the employee. Oh, wow. I had been working with my friend, Phil Feuerstein, who had, we had been up in the Catskill Mountains together. He went and got his engineering degree at UCLA and was working in, on one trip. He showed me when I worked for Mobile Oil in New York City, I used to travel to the West Coast to the Torrance Refinery. And I had relatives in West LA. So I always used to almost stay over. Would you I, fly? Was that, were you driving or flying? Flying. Oh, no. Oh. Flying. Oh. And I, I was in, it was, it was, they treated us really good because it was mobile oil. Oh, yes. Okay. So you were 
Yes, and like an executive first class there. Okay. And after I had the meeting with Schmertz, all of a sudden I get called in by my vice president of supply and distribution, who I am two away from at this point. And he said, Bob, what the F did you do? Go down to Morley Warner Jr. and start complaining about something? I have been advised to put you on a training assignment. Oh, wow. On the way home, I got home. I called Phil Furistine up. Phil, can we put something together where we can start something? Just get your butt out of here. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> I called a realtor up who saw, you know, who we had worked with, you know, in, in buying the house. And I asked her to meet me there and I called Elaine up. And I said, I'm calling you in advance because if the realtor gets there before me, I called the realtor. We're moving to California. Wow. Big move. And that, Quite a jump there. And that's what started our new existence, which, you know, we're going to talk about at a later time in the history of uh, Bob Allen. But it was something we had, and I had a Corvair convertible, a 1963 Corvair convertible that I wanted out there so badly. You know, it's an antique. It's worth a lot of money today if you have one that's running. And what happened was I would be able to drive it for 25 miles and it would conk out. Oh. <laughs> Drove another 25 miles, it would conk out again. So I brought it into the mechanic. And the mechanic fixed it. He said, you're all well and good to go. My cousin was our attorney my father's oldest sister, his, her son, who we became very close friends with the family when we moved out to Long Island. So there we are, we're packed up. I used the same company that had packed us up, but we had to pay for it this time. Mm -hmm. I was moving to California. I got an apartment in Tarzana that we we're gonna move into. And on the way to Brooklyn that night, the car comes out again. Oh, wow. So I had to have my father come out, pick us up, oh. bring us in, and I gave the car to somebody for $50. Oh. <laughs> so, we came out here, and uh, I became an entrepreneur and a shareholder instead of an employee, but have gone through the same types of things as Grandpa Harry did. I have too much faith and trust in other people. Yeah. We, we basically started, without going into too much detail, a manufacturing business that it grew to a point where we were in Chatsworth in a 33,000 square foot facility with a million dollars in back orders. My goodness. In 1973, when the oil industry decided to stop oil production in the Mideast. I got a call the next day from my chemical supplier. He said, Bob, I've got bad news and terrible news for you. What do you want first? 
said, give me the bad news. He said, the price of your chemicals are going up three times. Wow. I said, give me the worst news. He said, we don't have anything to ship you. Oh, dear. I had to wow. shut down the whole facility. Ah, in chats with, wow. However, we were working on something that I was able to go find somebody else who was doing the same manufacturing. And I worked out some agreement where we would get the commission on it. By this time, I knew I had to have something in writing. I wasn't taking chances. Oh, and yeah. In the 1970s, the biggest industry that I can remember was the van conversion business. And we developed the first cup holder in a moving vehicle. Oh my goodness. They had the vans were, they always had the motor in the middle of the driver's seat and the passenger seat in the front. And then it was all open in the back. Well, the van conversion was putting windows in, they were putting roofs that open up. They were putting videos in, video cameras, and we came up where and now they can put this thing and there are only three different styles, a Dodge, a Chevy, and a, uh, a Ford. A Ford. Yeah. So all we had to do is make three different models. Well, we got to the point where I used to go once a month into Chicago to talk to Sears Robot because they were one of our biggest buyers of the product. And we were invited by the vice president of Chrysler Motors to a dinner in Las Vegas during a trade show. And we didn't know why, but we found out he wanted to thank us for showing them, Chrysler Motors, what the vehicle of the future needs to be. And that was the start of the reduction of the SUVs. Oh my gosh, that's fabulous. All of a sudden, we didn't have the income coming in. Yeah, well, what did you call your company? Polyphase Products. Polyphase Products for the van conversions. For the van wow. conversions. Yeah. Amazing. Well, well, do we want to continue this another time? I think it probably would be best. Your your California journey with Elaine as well. All the all the transitions that had to happen. We'll we'll start that up at the next one. You got it. Thank you so much, Bob. It was wonderful hearing these stories, and uh, we'll see you again.